you're taking a medication that depletes B cells like Ucrevis, Casimta, Briambi, or Rituximab, and you're doing blood tests periodically for safety monitoring, but what do the blood tests mean? I'll explain in this video. Thank you to the good old vet for the video suggestion. I will give the disclaimer that this is not personalized advice. Please talk to your own provider as there simply is no standard protocol for monitoring these medications and different doctors have different opinions. Also, not everyone has the same disease, multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, myasthenia gravis, lupus, they're not the same, and also I would give different advice, say, to a 20-year-old who's completely healthy versus, say, a 60-year-old with multiple comorbidities who has had prior serious infections because the risk of serious infections with immunosuppressants is different. So again, talk to your own provider. To interpret the blood tests, you have to understand how these drugs work. So all of these drugs work on B lymphocytes, the B cells of the immune system, which are the cells that make antibodies or proteins which are supposed to bind to viruses, bacteria, and fungi and help your immune system to destroy them. They also do other things such as communicate with other white blood cells. These cells have a protein on the surface called CD20 and drugs such as Ocrevus, in addition to the other drugs I mentioned, such as Rituximab, Casimta, Briamvi, bind to this protein and cause the cells to break open and die. This happens almost instantaneously during the treatment within hours. But not all cells in the B cell lineage shown here contain the protein CD20, and cells that don't contain this protein are immune to these drugs. For instance, stem cells in the bone marrow, they don't express CD20, they're not affected by these drugs, hence you can regenerate your B lymphocytes over time, though it may take a long while. Also, some B lymphocytes can turn into these larger cells called plasma cells that lose CD20 and are again immune to drugs such as Ucrevus and Casimta, but they also make antibodies. Hence, a lot of people taking these drugs have very low or undetectable levels of B cells, but normal antibody levels, and that may be why they're not getting significant infections. However, if you continuously take these medications over long periods of time, your plasma cells have have a limited half-life, you can lose them, and your antibodies levels can go down, and that's associated with a greater risk of infections. So now we'll move to the blood test. So these are the tests that I tend to perform at baseline prior to starting the medication. So I would test a chronic hepatitis panel, looking for hepatitis B and C. The reason is because these drugs are well known to reactivate latent chronic hepatitis. Let's say you have hepatitis C, but it's not causing any symptoms. If you take an immunosuppressant like Ucrevus or Rituximab, it could cause you to have active hepatitis and liver damage. These drugs, of course, don't cause you to get viral hepatitis, but if someone has hepatitis C, I would want them to see a gastroenterologist or a hepatologist and likely be treated with appropriate antiviral medication and get clearance from a hepatologist prior to getting the drug. A hepatitis A is usually cleared and doesn't cause chronic infection and usually wouldn't be a big deal. I also often test varicella antibodies. Varicella is the virus which causes chicken pox and shingles just because shingles is a well-known complication of these drugs which can cause a painful rash. So if someone has a history of chicken pox and low antibody titers, I might offer them vaccination against shingles even if they're relatively young. I would also check a complete blood count. This looks at red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, just because low platelets has been associated with these drugs, usually in rare cases. Also, sometimes we can see low levels of a white blood cell called neutrophils, which is a totally different class of white blood cells than B cells, but it has been reported and is associated with infections. I would also do specific tests to look at the lymphocytes, the T and B cells. I would also look at immunoglobin or antibody levels because they're associated with the risk of infections and liver tests because in rare cases, these drugs can cause problem with the liver. It's not common, but it has been reported. I also do some other routine tests such as creatinine or a measure of kidney function. In specific populations, I may do other tests. For instance, in children, there's a risk of cytomegalovirus infection. So I may check CMV titers, although serious CMV infection with only 
only a single immunosuppressant such as Ocrevus in adults is relatively rare because they have some degree of long-term immunity. And in someone with a history of a certain prior infection, I may do a specific test just for them. Again, different physicians may have different ideas about what tests are necessary to monitor for risk of infection. So this is a CBC or complete blood count. A lot of the items here wouldn't be affected by these drugs typically. These are just the normal ranges. So hemoglobin or red blood cell mass, usually not affected by these drugs. The overall white blood cell count, WBC, is usually not affected because the B cells represent a very small percentage of overall white blood cells. Platelets, these are the cells involved in clotting, can be low only rarely with these drugs, and that could lead to bleeding. And also neutrophils, a different type of white blood cell that normally should not be affected by these drugs, but in very rare cases could be low, and that can be quite serious. That's another thing to look at. One thing that can be difficult to interpret is hepatitis B serology. Of course, it's important to make sure you're not actively infected with hepatitis B because reactive activation of hepatitis B can occur with these drugs. This chart helps with the interpretation. What we're looking for is immunity against hepatitis B, hopefully due to vaccination, but no active infection. If you look at the third line, you see the positive anti-hepatitis B surface antibodies that suggest immunity, and you want someone to test negative for the actual antigen and for core antibodies, which can be associated with infection. If someone's negative for everything, maybe they have just never seen either the virus or the vaccine, and if they haven't had the vaccine series, they could go forward with it ideally prior to starting an immunosuppressant. If someone actually tests positive for hepatitis B, I, being a neurologist, would usually recommend consultation with a gastroenterologist hepatologist. The next thing we're going to look at is test for specific types of lymphocytes and other white blood cells, and we use a laboratory technique called flow cytometry. The way this works is that the sample is stained that marks different cell surface markers. The sample is driven through a machine and there's a laser light and a detector and the computer can figure out how many of what different types of cells are present based on their cell surface markers and you can see this chart showing what the different cell surface markers mean and we'll take a look at a few of them relevant to B cell depleting drugs. So these are the normal ranges for different types of white blood cells based on their cell surface markers. Now be very cautious about the units unless you're familiar with SI units be careful interpreting the these laboratory values for yourself because different labs and different countries use different units. So CD45 is a generic marker of a lot of different types of white blood cells, not particularly useful to us. CD3 is a measure of lymphocytes, the T cells, cells of the adaptive immune system. So not cells of the innate immune system like neutrophils or macrophages. CD4 are markers of helper T cells. These are the cells that are infected by the HIV virus and CD8 are cells that are the killer T cells. These cells should be normal in people receiving B cell depleting drugs. Now, we're looking at the absolute values here. Some labs report both absolute values and percentages, and the percentages can be a little bit misleading. They may appear high for CD4 and CD8 positive cells because the B cells are depleted, and so the percentage of T lymphocytes is higher even though their absolute number have not changed. Now, the most interesting cells to us are going to be the CD19 and CD20 positive cells. These are the markers of the B lymphocytes, the cells that are killed by these drugs. And they're usually very, very similar, if not exactly the same. So a lot of people, if they receive these drugs and we were to check them shortly afterwards, they may be zero and very close to that. And there's a lot of variation from person to person. Some people six months later or even a year la later, they can be zero or very low. And some people, they may come back two or three months later and start to come back exponentially. Well, what does that mean? Well, in some cases, let's say you get the drug and a week later you have totally normal B lymphocytes and you had a bad reaction to the drug, it could mean you have anti-drug antibodies and it may make the drug less effective. Now, 
This is uncommon, but it can happen. Most of the reactions to these drugs, by the way, are due to killing the cells themselves and the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, an infusion reaction, but not a true allergy. The definition of allergy means your own immune system is reacting to that specific drug. And so there's a little bit of debate about the significance of these levels. For instance, some people would say it's important for them to be very low for a prolonged period of time, but of course that can lead to lower antibodies and potentially more infections. Most of the observational data suggests that even if the B lymphocytes come back, the drug is not necessarily less effective. So some people, including myself, may advocate for not continuously depleting B lymphocytes over a long period of time, and many people, including myself, would consider it to be acceptable for the B lymphocytes to come back even between doses in multiple sclerosis. For diseases such as neuromyelitis optica, many doctors are somewhat more aggressive. The cells that are CD16 and CD56 positive are natural killer cells believed to be important in fighting cancer, typically normal in people receiving these drugs. I'll show you some examples of B cell counts in different research studies. This is a study on idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. This is an autoimmune disease that causes low platelets and bleeding. And there are three individuals, patient one, two, and three, and you can see their levels of CD20 cells prior to treatment and even one one day after rituximab, the levels are very low in all of them, basically undetectable, because these drugs work instantly, even within hours. This is a study on ochrevis and multiple sclerosis. You can see the baseline levels on the left side of the charts of the CD19 and CD20 cells, both the B cells, prior to ochrevis and afterwards, and you can see the levels are zero. So it's not normal to have a normal level of B lymphocytes after getting these drugs. Let's look at some longer term outcomes. This is primary progressive multiple sclerosis, people who received rituximab, M116, M154, M191, M602. These are different people in the study. They just used an arbitrary name. And you can see they looked at the percentage of CD19 positive cells. Let's look at M116. You can see before the drug, the level was 18.43%. One month afterwards, it was 0.14. And even 18 months after afterwards, it was 4.42, much, much lower than baseline. And this can vary tremendously from person to person. So the half-life of rituximab is only three weeks. For ochrevis, it's four weeks. So after six months, these drugs are long gone, but you can still have low levels because it takes a long time for the bone marrow to regenerate B lymphocytes. And this can be quite variable from person to person, but there's a greater risk of having prolonged depletion of B lymphocytes with long-term use of these drugs. Now, in my opinion, the most important test for long-term safety monitoring of these drugs is the immunoglobin or antibody levels. So this is just a study on 15 normal people not taking immunosuppressants to see what typical antibody levels are. And you can see IgG, immunoglobin G, IgA, immunoglobin A, and IgM, immunoglobin M. Now, IgM are the new antibodies that were recently created, and they can go down very quickly, even in people who have not taken these drugs for a long period of time, but the good news is they're not that strongly linked to the risk of infections. So, of course, anyone taking these drugs should be considered to be immunosuppressed, but having low IgM is, generally speaking, not that concerning unless someone has other risk factors or is experiencing infections at least in my personal opinion. IgA are the immunoglobins in the secretions, like in the saliva and in the gastrointestinal tract, thought to be important in preventing respiratory and gastrointestinal infections. Now, the most important is IgG, the long-term antibodies in the blood. They're most associated with the risk of infections. Now, you can see the typical value is around 1,300, but there's a huge range. Some people have a baseline of 750, some people 1,900. And if the typical lab shows a normal range of above 700, so below 700 is considered to be abnormal, again, double check the units. Now, 
It's well known that if people have levels under 500, that more dramatically increases the risk of infections. And I've seen rare cases of people with levels of around 150 taking these drugs. So what do you do with this information? Well, in many people who are lower risk and doing well, I wouldn't be concerned about a slightly low IgM. In lower IgG, I would be more concerned. Again, it depends on the disease, how desperately they need the medication, whether or not the person is actually having infections, their age, their other comorbidities. I would take all this into account in my recommendations to an individual. But let's say someone has a baseline of IgG of 1300, and now it's 600. I would be concerned that they have an increased risk of getting serious infections, even if they have not experienced them previously. What can you do about it? Well, one thing you can do is stop taking the medication, or you could take it less often to allow the B lymphocytes to come back and produce antibodies. You could change to a different medication. In some cases, we can give another drug called intravenous immunoglobin. This is artificial immunoglobins that temporarily boost up your levels of antibodies. And this has a temporary effect because if you're not making antibodies, they'll go back down quite quickly. This drug has its own side effects. It can cause allergic reactions, in some cases kidney problems, or in very rare cases clotting events like a heart attack or stroke, though relatively low risk in a young healthy patient. I have one patient I gave IVIG to who had mononeuritis multiplex, a different autoimmune disease, and she developed central retinal artery occlusion, a stroke in the eye, causing permanent loss of vision in one eye. So it's not a joke to take this medication, but that is one of the options. So I hope this was helpful. I'd be interested to know if you've taken these drugs, if you've had laboratory abnormalities, if it's been associated with infections or other complications. And as usual, let me know if you have ideas for other videos.